I like tube amps. If you are inclined to like tube amps, then I would encourage you to buy one. But the range of quality among various tube amps is unfortunately large. And I'm sorry to say that many of the budget offerings have design flaws that should disqualify them from your prospective purchase options. You might think that a technology as old as tube amplification is old enough that it should have been perfected by now, and tube amps suffering from serious design flaws should have been weeded out long ago. I'm sorry to report that many popular tube amps, including those receiving many positive reviews on YouTube, do not, in my opinion, pass muster. These are amps that, were I to have made and tested them, I would consider them defective and subject them to redesign. What are some common design flaws? And why do they persist? And will I name names? Hmm. Keep watching and find out. Welcome to Lancaster Hi-Fi. I'm happy to have you watching. If you like this video, I hope you'll dig into my back catalog and subscribe to the channel. As the name of the channel implies, my attention is focused on tube amps for hi-fi, but if your interest is primarily in guitar and bass amps, then this video may also interest you, because an amp that's badly designed for hi-fi may actually employ techniques favored by lovers of guitar amps. I also want to give a special nod to guitar people because they stuck with tube amps during a time when hi-fi enthusiasts abandoned them. Hold on, though. Why would guitar people want amps that are badly designed for hi-fi? They might because guitar players tend to like the distortion produced by tube amps. For hi-fi, an amp that produces a lot of distortion is either misused or badly designed. But if that distortion is desirable for guitar, then designers of guitar amps might employ techniques that designers of hi-fi amps should avoid. Okay, Bad Amp Design 101 starts now. 1. Choose a bad operating point for your gain stage so that it badly distorts the input and hide your mistake with negative feedback. This is a great way to add lots of even harmonic distortion. You bias your gain stage so that one side of your wave is always comfortably where the tube is nice and linear, and the other side is all squished. You can do the same thing with the output stage, but it's easier to hide in the input stage. With negative feedback, a lot of that squishedness will be rounded off in the output stage, and the output will end up with a lot of low order even harmonics when the volume is cranked up. This kind of amp might be awesome for a guitar player. It would have a nice clean tone at low volume and provide that sweet tube crunch when driven hard. Still, you would only be overdriving the input stage. The output tubes would be operating well within their happy place, so the expensive output tubes wouldn't suffer and die prematurely. But why would you use such a design if you wanted a hi-fi amp? You wouldn't unless you were incompetent. Two. Use an input tube that can't keep up with what the output stage needs. Typically, this means using a tube that can't provide enough current to drive the grid of the output stage. This bad design technique causes slewing distortion at higher frequencies, and it can't be corrected with negative feedback. You might be able to get around the problem by underpowering the output stage so that it doesn't demand what the input stage can't deliver. Underpowering the output also has the advantage of allowing you to use a cheaper, weaker power transformer. In general, however, avoiding this bad design technique can require a radical redesign of the input stage. Like, you probably need to use a different tube. Why would you employ this bad design technique? You do it to avoid radical redesign. Duh! Besides, slewing distortion isn't all that noticeable because it's limited to higher frequencies. If your clientele is old enough, they won't even have hearing in that part of the frequency spectrum. It'll be fine! Can you, as a consumer, easily spot this particular bad design technique? I don't know, this one is tough. I've had this problem with gain and inverter stages using 12AX7 tubes, or even just in the gain stage. The 12AX7 has a lot of gain, but it operates at pretty low current. I fixed the problem by using 6DJ8 or ECC88 tubes instead. Those operate at substantially higher current. But I don't know, this one is hard to spot. 3. 
Use an output transformer that is not up to the job. Most of the time, this bad design technique is employed by using a small output transformer, and you avoid this technique with big iron. That's what we call transformers, iron. Yeah, yeah, they use steel, but iron sounds cooler, more steampunky. You can hide this bad design technique by potting your transformers, and by potting, I mean putting them inside steel cases or cans or pots. You can mask the size of the transformer by using oversized cans, and you can mask the low mass of iron by filling the extra space with gravel. Yeah, apparently that's a thing. Probably epoxy too, so the gravel doesn't rattle. How can the consumer spot this trick? He can't, not without listening to the amp, and even then the trick won't be obvious. Why employ this bad design technique? Because big iron is expensive. 4. You can just pull component values out of your ass. That way you don't have to do that icky math. This bad design technique is easy because you can just wing it and hope for the best. The risk is that the resulting amp will be so bad that the reviewers won't just chalk up the design flaws to tubiness. Still, there's a pretty good chance that a lot of reviewers will give you a pass and that the rest will just be the ones who do actual measurements, as in, you only believe in measurements and not your ears and then you're golden. Bad component values can make it into amps when adapting existing designs to different tubes, especially when the data sheets for those tubes are difficult to understand. I'll give you an example from my own experience. I adapted Morgan Jones's Beavis Valley design for use with different output tubes, 6V6s instead of EL84s. On my first try, I didn't understand the 6V6 data sheets so I didn't change some key component values that really needed to be changed. The 6V6 and EL84 can produce similar output power, but the 6V6 has less gain and therefore needs a bigger signal from the gain stage. To get that gain, I needed to change a couple of resistor values to reduce the amount of negative feedback. Also, the 6V6 typically uses different plate voltage and bias current, and ultimately I changed the value of the bias resistor and even used a different rectifier tube. But guess what? The amp actually performed pretty well without the appropriate changes. Sure, the amp didn't have as much gain as it should, and the output tubes probably would have worn out prematurely, but the amp's design flaws might have escaped notice indefinitely had my own testing and further digging into the data sheets not led me to correct the design. Would a consumer have ever spotted my mistakes? Probably not. 5. Use a design that needs a lot of negative feedback and introduces a lot of frequency-dependent phase shift. You could compound the problem by not using a capacitor in the feedback network to reduce the negative feedback at low frequencies, but the resulting amp probably wouldn't even be stable. More likely, you'd simply put a large enough capacitor in the feedback network to reduce the negative feedback at low frequencies. If you also use an undersized output transformer, then the base frequencies will sound horrible, but you can just pass off the design flaw with, that's the way tube amps are, and people will probably give you a pass. 6. Don't worry too much about getting the high frequency roll-off point right. Either you make it too high, and the high frequency phase shift turns the negative feedback into positive feedback so that the amplifier oscillates at, say, 100 kilohertz, or you make the roll-off frequency too low and kill the high-frequency response. If your amp has high-frequency oscillation, but it's not bad enough to cause motorboating, then no one will notice unless they do measurements. Nerds. Yeah, the oscillation will rob your amp of power and may even cause users to burn out their tweeters, but they'll probably just figure it was their own fault. If you kill the high frequencies, then people will just say that your amp sounds warm and tuby, and you'll be fine. I mean, do they expect a tube amp to sound as good as a solid state amp? Sheesh! But serious talk now. How do bad tube amps get good reviews? Reviewers might chalk up deficiencies to tube sound, or this amp sounds best with acoustic instruments and singing. Also, it's not always easy to distinguish limitations due to trade-offs from bad design. What I would recommend is that you, as a consumer, do not dismiss people like Amir at Audio Science Reviews and Steph of Skunky Designs. 
These people have invested in test gear, and they put in the work of listening and measuring. They use the two in tandem to learn what bad design sounds like. Skunky Designs is, by the way, an awesome channel, and I rewatched a lot of Steph's videos in preparation for this one. She has put a lot of work into carefully testing some popular tube amps, finding their deficiencies and associated design flaws, and figuring out how to fix those flaws and dramatically improve the amps. She's also revealed some unfixable problems. Yeah, I'm going to name names. The Boyuranj Ryzong A12 is a single-ended amp with EL34 pentodes wired in ultra-linear mode in the output and a whole 12AX7 dual triode with the two stages wired in parallel for the input or driver or gain stage. Why parallel triodes in the driver stage? Maybe they figured that wired in parallel, the relatively low current 12AX7s could provide the current needed by the EL34s? Kind of a head shaker. The EL34s in the output stage were undervolted and given a bad operating point, as if the circuit were designed for 6v6s, and they figured they could just sub in the EL34s to make more power and double up the triodes in the driver stage to make up for the greater input current demanded by the EL34. <sighs> the Buyurange Rysong A50 is a single-ended amp with 300B triodes in the output stage and a whole 6SN7 dual triode for each driver stage. The design is similar to the J.C. Morrison DIY 300B amp. In both cases, each channel uses two triode gain stages, one after the other. And that's just not the best way to design a single-ended triode amp, because you generally want to minimize the number of stages and keep that number even, because each stage introduces some phase lag and each stage inverts the signal. Phase lag isn't the worst thing for an SET amp without negative feedback, but phase lag can make an amp with negative feedback unstable. If you feedback a signal that's more than 90 degrees out of phase with the input, then you turn negative feedback into positive feedback, and positive feedback is bad. That's what you get when you stick your guitar right in front of the speaker in order to get horrible sounds that, yes, a true virtuoso can turn into art, but you don't want your amp making such sounds by default. Since each amplification stage inverts the signal, you generally want to use an even number of stages because two inversions make a non-inversion. An inverted output isn't a huge deal, but some people claim to hear the difference. Hell, I had one commenter make a convincing case that the ultimate signal should be inverted. But yeah, if you want the output to be in phase with the input, you want a small, even number of stages, like two. Back to the A50. The second gain stage was poorly designed in that it couldn't provide a big enough voltage swing to the 300B in the output, so there was no way to get the sort of power that the 300B should provide. The second gain stage was clipping way before the output stage. Steph fixed the problem by rewiring the two 6SN7 triode gain stages into a single cascode which is a circuit that uses two triodes to function more like a single pentode. It was an elegant fix. Oh, and the A50 also had insufficient high voltage for the 300B tubes. The Wilsonton R300 is another single-ended triode amp using 300B tubes in the output. Steph found that it could only produce a little more than half the advertised power. It was ridiculously sensitive, needing only 0.28 volts RMS to reach that maximum power, and the output transformers were not good. Steph had to use new output transformers to solve the problems with the R300. The knob sound, or noob sound, 6P1, used a cascode driver stage when a simple one triode stage would have been fine. Moreover, the second triode in the cascode used a grid leak bias that's used in guitar amps but has no place in hi-fi amps. The Deckware SE84 UFO is a popular single-ended triode amp that uses EL84 pentodes wired as triodes in the output stage. Some people really like these, but they can only deliver maybe one watt per channel. I think you probably shouldn't try to get more than about half a watt per channel. 
I base that on my first DGSE-1 build. The DGSE-1 is a single-ended design by Dave Gillespie and uses EL84s as pentodes and negative feedback. I've built several of these, and my first build still serves as my desktop amp at work. For that one, I added a couple of switches so that I could choose triode or pentode mode and negative feedback or not. In pentode mode with negative feedback, the amp produces a bit more than 3 watts per channel. In triode mode without negative feedback, that is, as a single-ended triode amp, it produces 1 watt or less per channel. I generally prefer pentode mode with negative feedback. Pentode mode without negative feedback does not sound good. Triode mode with negative feedback? Ridiculously little power. I might use SET mode more often if I had way more sensitive speakers. I'll throw in a mention of one amp that got the thumbs up from Steph. The Musicare X7 uses push-pull KT88s to deliver some serious power. A commenter recently asked me what I thought about the Tube Cube 7, which is apparently also sold as the Miniwatt N3. Like the DGSE1, it's a single-ended amp with EL84s as pentodes in the output for a bit over 3 watts per channel. It's advertised as 3.5 watts per channel. I looked into it and found a review online. The review was awesome because it showed the amp's frequency response. And that's where this amp lost me because the high end was substantially rolled off. Minus 3 dB at 10 kHz and minus 7 dB at 20 kHz. Some people really like this amp, but I would consider it defective if I had built it. Ew, if you're so great, prove that you can do better. Okay, here's the gain versus frequency at half a watt per channel for an amp I recently sold. The buyer had some concerns, so I took it back, checked it out, and made some measurements. I also did some interior work with electronic safe adhesive to make sure my careful placement of components and wires will stay put. I then took it back to him, and we had a long listening session with his Tenoy Monitor Gold speakers while we drank a nice single malt. He was pretty ecstatic, and I was happy that he was happy. Now, I can't make the Tube Cube's price point, or rather, I won't, because the Tube Cube's price is much less than my time and craftsmanship are worth, not to mention my customer service. But the fact that people are giving the Tube Cube Mini Watt positive reviews is a head shaker for me. I don't even understand how they managed to design it so poorly when there are much better, freely available designs on the web. How do these poorly designed amps garner such positive reviews? And if the design flaws are so obvious, why don't we see more negative reviews? First, I don't think the positive reviews are dishonest. Let me make that clear. These reviewers are not lying to you. I just think they have different expectations than I do, and I think you should. Second, I think the negative reviews don't get published or aired. Why not? You know what? I'm not going to say what we're all thinking. We can take them at their words. In fact, Steve Guttenberg made a video about why he doesn't do bad reviews. I thought his stated reasons were fine. However, I think consumers are left with skewed impressions when reviewers not only don't make bad reviews, but also remain silent about the bad reviews they didn't make. Consumers only see a bunch of positive reviews and don't know why some reviewers don't review some products. We've all seen recently what can happen when reviewers say things that makers don't like. Yes, I'm talking about Tekton threatening Amir and Aaron with legal action. Am I worried? Nah, my brother's a lawyer, my father and both grandfathers were lawyers, and more to the point, I only have 4,000 subscribers. So, if you enjoyed or appreciated this video, help me get into legal trouble and subscribe. And give the video a thumbs up if you think more people ought to see it. Comments help as well, and I really enjoy those. I'd like to keep growing this channel and maybe actually make my videos worth the time it takes to write, shoot, and edit them. Have a great day, and I'll talk to you soon.